good to be together. Um, I want to read a, a statement that the UN Security General made in February of this year. Uh, UN, United Nations, right? Security General. And here's what he said. He actually he's warning the United Nations of that we have entered into the age of chaos. And he says it's causing huge suffering and it's thwarting world progress. And it has to be stopped. And he said, there's so much anger and hate and noise in our world today. Every day and at every turn, it seems there's war. He said, people just want peace and security and to be able to live their lives with dignity. Dignity. For millions of people caught up in conflict around the world, life is a deadly, daily, hungry hell. Pretty straightforward uh, thesis or analysis of, of our world. He said it's, it's chaos. And I was just looking at what are the things that are happening worldwide, and I appreciate uh, Justin taking a perspective beyond the borders, right? America's borders. There's been floods in Brazil, this, a few things this year. Floods in Brazil and Africa that are, have taken many lives. The Taiwanese earthquake, the tornadoes in the Midwest, Indiana, wildfires setting records in Texas. Of course, there's political animosity. There are protests on many campuses. Ukraine and Russian war. Of course, the Israeli-Palestinian war, wars in Yemen, Sudan, the Congo, and on and on right now. There's random acts of, unfortunately, violence constantly. Job loss, job pressures, educational system shifts. Some of you as parents are feeling that. Cultural attacks, public discourse seems to be a bit vitriolic. Redefining of basic life concepts. Right can seem wrong and wrong can seem right. Upside down, it's topsy-turvy, and it can seem a bit convoluted. So perhaps his assessment isn't that far off. The title of the message today is to trust God through the chaos. And I appreciate it, Al, he kind of reminded us that if everything were written about Jesus, the gospel says it couldn't. There's so much. And so what God puts in his word is vital. There's a message for us. So turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. I've always, this uh, passage about the basically the demoniac being healed, I've always, as a kid, I referenced him as, and this is not politically correct, but I referenced him as Crazy Harry. That's the way I've always, Mark chapter 5 is Crazy Harry. And that's, and we're going to take a look at Crazy Harry and uh, what went on in his life. But what we're going to look at is, in order to trust God through our chaos, it is one, to understand that Jesus seeks out chaos. That Jesus defeats chaos, and that he transforms chaos. Let's read Mark chapter 5. We're going to read 1 through 20. It says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. 
he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What's your name? My name is Legion, he replied. We're many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. So he gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And they told him about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus didn't let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So the man went away, and he began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. This is, this story, this, and it's not a story, right? It's an incident in the life of Jesus, and it's recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. Now, it, if something's in the Bible once, we're all good. There's a reason this is a story that all three of those who wrote the synoptic gospels listed. What is the message that God is wanting us to hear? And I believe it is to trust Jesus through your chaos. But I want to hit something right off the bat. Talks about demon possession. We don't talk about demon possession. Very I, I can't remember the last sermon. Let's today's title is it Demon Possession. It just doesn't happen much. And you A to Z, you might be of a, a persuasion conservative. Demon possession passed away when the apostles died. It just that that stuff just doesn't happen anymore. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Uh, others of us might be like, you know, you pray and you're like, God, cast out the demon of doubt or the demon of sickness or whatever. Or you might fall in between. Well, I, I I've got good news for you. I have no idea. So we're not gonna go there about demon possession and that. All right? But I don't want us to be distracted from the message because that's a, hey, I think there's a lot of things in the scriptures that God says, again, things are hidden, but it's, it's our job to search it out. Um, and then the whole thing, yeah, 2,000 pigs belong to someone and gone. It's like, well, did Jesus not even care? Really? You just destroyed this? That's not the, the message that I believe God wants us to get, per se. But hey, on your own, go back and study that out and ask, why did Jesus do that? All right? But Jesus seeks out chaos. In chapter 4, verse 35, you don't need to turn there, but it says that this is right before this incident. Jesus says to his disciples, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. So they're on in Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee, and five miles across is this place called the Gerasenes. Five-mile boat trip. Jesus says, guys, let's leave and go to the other side. I believe Jesus went there very purposefully, not just let's get away from the crowd. Because he could have gone anywhere, and that wasn't the shortest trip he could have taken. But he went to the Gerasenes. And as you read through the story, you find out that 
it, one, it's the area where the Decapolis was, which is Gentile. Jesus was in Judea, Galilee, his country, and he left his country, and he went to a very Gentile area, not to the Jews. In fact, that's why there was herdsmen who had pigs. You wouldn't find a Jew herding pigs. It was unclean. So this was a very Gentile area that Jesus specifically went to. And then when it was all said and done, Jesus got into the boat and went right back to Capernaum. I don't think it was a coincidence that he went there and found this man. I think Jesus, we, we like to think, well, don't have an agenda. I think Jesus had one. It's called, I'm going to save this man. And he's going to do it for a bigger purpose too. But I'm going to go there, and because we'll, we'll look at this guy. It wasn't like hidden and no one knew about this guy. But Jesus is purposeful. He's very purposeful in our lives. He has an agenda, if you will. And it's a good one, but he has a plan. He's not just happenstance. Remember when the messengers came to Jesus and was it Herod? He says, hey, Herod wants to kill you. He says, hey, tell that fox, I'm going to try about demons today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I'm going to reach my goal. I'm going to Jerusalem. Jesus was that kind of man. He was on purpose. And so when he goes, he seeks out crazy Herod. And it was for him, but Jesus is, God is, the only real multitasker. He went there for this man, but also it was to go see the Gentiles. And if you read through the whole Gospel of Mark, there's only one other time, I believe, maybe two, where he goes outside of his own country. And so it's very specific. He's going to go there for this man, but also he wants to reach the Gentiles because the Gospel needs to go there too. So sometimes in our lives we think, what is God doing in my life? Like this, this man, he came to meet his need, but God's doing something beyond that. When he's working in our life, it's not just us. And so sometimes we ask, well, why didn't God answer my prayer in this way? Because this seems like it would be the right thing for me or the right thing for my family or the way that's gonna, I can be used best. And God's like, but it's not just about you. That was a lesson my wife tried to teach me for about the first 20 years of our marriage. It's not all about you. It took me around 25 years to get that. But that's the way we can be sometimes in our walk with God. Why is this not happening? Because, and God's like, it's not all about you. It's all about you, but it's not all about you. This man's life was chaos is the best way to describe it. I won't re uh, turn to the Gospel of Luke or Matthew, but there's a few details that they give along with what Mark did. Here's what this man's life was like. He lived in the tombs. When I go for a run, there, my favorite place to run in Lenore City is one of the, it's the, tomb, it's the uh, cemetery. And some people, when I tell them that, look at me like James is looking at me. Okay, all right. I, that's where I run because it's quiet. And there's not a lot of traffic. And I'm out in the country and... But this man, that's, that's a little weird. I get it. But he lived in the tomb. The Bible says no one could subdue him. Oh, they tried, but no one could actually subdue him. They put guards. That's either Matthew or Luke. That didn't work. They chained him, shackled him, hands and feet, broke chains, broke him. He would scream and cry out. That would make you uncomfortable. Sometimes, if, and it happens here, but living in Chicago and living in Denver, some, uh, 16th Street Mall in Denver area sometimes was a dangerous place or kind of a scary place to be sometimes because you might hear some who might be insane or 
on drugs or and you're hearing them cry out saying and what what's the nat- natural thing to do whoa this is dangerous this guy was screaming and crying out the bible says all day all night in the tombs in the hills screaming and crying out self destructive he was cutting himself with stones cutting himself People in pain do destructive things. He was out of his mind. That's what the people did. He was, out of his mind. he was possessed by demons. Matthew says that the people couldn't even pass by there. He says, you just don't go that direction. Luke said he was naked. No clothes. Homeless. So this, it's like, well, why does why does God put this in the scripture? Why so? It's just almost like we read it and it's a story. But have we ever experienced it? I'm not going to speak for everyone. I haven't. I've never seen something like this. Why is it in the scriptures? This is dirty, grimy, fearful chaos in the form of a human being. Can you think of a like a less likely person for Jesus to reach out to? He didn't just reach out to him. He made a beeline. Let's leave. Let's go. We'll go straight to Gary City. He knew who he was going. We don't struggle with demon possession. It doesn't mean we don't have chaos. We don't have challenges in our lives. But do you recognize chaos that God rescued you? Do you remember it? Al was talking about going back and thinking those earlier days. Do you remember the chaos that God rescued you from? Ours is not quite like this, this dirty, grimy, fearful, smelly, gross, stay away, dangerous chaos. Ours is more clean, sanitized hidden, but it's there. I I think of the religious pride, that chaos that God delivered me from early on. I was becoming a Christian. Religious pride can be chaotic because it keeps you from getting close to God. Self-destructive character. Isolating selfishness. The imposter syndrome. You ever felt that? And and yet we put up a mask so that we feel the imposter. We don't feel like we're who we need to be or that I measure up or that I'm who I want to be. And so we put a mask on. And many of us for years had those masks. We were walking around with the imposter syndrome. Some of our clean, sanitized chaos is, is simply the challenge is that in this group right here is facing job pressure, challenges on the job, or job loss, and you're looking for work, and it's hard, and the financial impact, and you're thinking about it. Marriage conflict, some of us, that's the chaos that's that's happening. It's, I'm having a hard time in my relationship with my spouse. Or family members. We have the challenges. This may not be as obvious as as this man. Why was Jesus so determined to go where, in reality, others feared to go? They literally said, we can't go that way. And they tried everything they could. And yet Jesus goes straight there. I think it was Jesus' faith, his hope, his love, it drove him. It wasn't, I have that kind of agenda of, Check, I need to do this. Check, I need... He was driven by a faith and a hope for people's lives and a genuine love that would take five hours to go meet this crazy, out-of-control guy. That kind of faith, hope, and love, it makes you go sit with a friend on their porch day after day when they're struggling to treat. That's faith, hope, 
It makes you put yourself in your brother's or sister's shoes and you empathize with them rather than judge their weakness or their lack of X, Y, or Z. It makes you go and empathize. Why was Jesus so determined? Faith, hope, and love. It makes you actually pray for your brothers and sisters instead of saying, I'll pray for you. No, you actually pray for your brothers and sisters because you love them. You have hope for them. It makes you slow to criticize others when they're doing their best. And even cause you to raise your hand or speak up and say, what can I do? Let me pitch in. That kind of faith, hope, and love, it makes you loyal to your neighbors. It makes you get to know them. You do things for them. You serve them. You find out their needs, and you help whether or not they'll ever repay or ever respond to the gospel. You just love them, and you know them, and they know you, and your friends. You look for ways to serve. We may not see the demon possessed, but we see people in pain. Or they're struggling with the imposter syndrome. It's all good. Yeah, things are great. You see my new car. And yet, inside, they might be struggling with isolation, loneliness, whatever. There is chaos around us. It just doesn't look like what Jesus saw here. But we can't be fooled by it. But Jesus, not only he seeks it out, he goes where others won't go because he he knows there's a challenge there, but he defeats the chaos. When Jesus asked, what's your name? Not that he didn't know, but he asked, and what was the man's response? Legion, right? Legion is a military term that stood for 6,000 men. We are legion. Now, I don't know that he was literally saying there's 6,000 demons here, but legion, he said it for a reason. And, you know, you read the scriptures, and it's like, you remember one guy, he was demon-possessed, it was a single demon, and it says whenever the spirit uh, comes on him, it, he, it throws him into, on the ground and into the fire, he foams. Remember that one? It was one demon, and it would throw him into the fire. Mary Magdalene, Magdalene had seven demons. This guy, a legion of demons. It's like worst case possible. And why does God put this in here? We'll see. But this this was like, it's beyond understanding. Legion of demons. It was worst case because what was inside this man was enough evil that it would fill somehow and impact 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of evil. And not just influence them, but just immediately send them to their death. 2,000. Over the cliff. That's what was living inside this man. That's a lot of destructive evil. And yet God shows us that Jesus goes to it. The the townspeople, they tried. They did what they could. And what it ended up being is just trying to chain him and keep him away, keep him locked up, control it, because they couldn't fix it. They didn't have a solution, so they just simply try to isolate him and get him away. That was their only answer to something that was just as impossible. And in our lives, we may try our own remedies. Remedies for the pain or the things that we're going through. And those remedies might not be very helpful. Some of them might be, I'm going to drink a little too much. Beer? Satan? 
tempt with that? I don't know. Finding entertainment, that's, that's my salve. They just forget things. What's the remedy? Theirs was control. And sometimes we turn to that remedy. As parents, it's hard being a parent. And I'm actually going to say, I think it's probably harder being a parent now, at least at this point, than, than it was when I was raising my kids. Now, probably not true because, you know, nothing new under the sun. But it's a different kind of challenge than what raising my kids and what they had to face. And so sometimes what we do, let me just control it. I can just tell my kids what to do, when to do, how to do, stay away, don't do that, do this, and we box. And then what do they do with that box? But we're not sure what to do, so we try and control it. Sometimes we, like as Christians, we want to impact our neighbors, we want to impact our families, and so it's, it's about control and what I can do and what remedy I can apply. And if I just do X, Y, and Z, then they're going to be open or then I'm going to be able to impact no, stop trying to control. Do what Jesus did. Love. Get in there. Get in the dirt and the grind. He wasn't about controlling. What's interesting, when Jesus shows up, and it says, as soon as he gets there, it says, the Legion, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran away to put some distance between himself and Jesus. No. He did the exact opposite that you would think a legion of demons would do. Jesus arrives on the shore, and from a distance, you would think a demon would be like, oh my goodness, that is the Son of God. I am out of here. They... He ran to Jesus because it's like, I can't outrun Jesus. That's Jesus, the Son. And that's what he even said. You are the Son of the Most High God. And so instead of running, because he knew he was defeated right there, he runs to Jesus, falls on his knees, and begs, please don't torture us. Please, please, please send us. Please. Evil seems intimidating, but it whimpers in the presence of God. Jesus didn't, he didn't even start to cast out the demon. He just arrived, and the demon surrender. Done. It's over. No situation. None. No situation is different for God. Not one. Everyone else is amazed. Whatever situation you're facing, it is not different for Jesus. Remember that Jesus, if you could, what was if if I can? No, everything is possible for him who believes. This is not a problem. And six thousand demons. Not a problem. Didn't lift a finger. Jesus is not, or actually Jesus is unafraid of what we do. He's able to rescue completely what we do. He brings victory from absolute futility. Not a chance. It's like the uncontrollable versus the unstoppable. So therefore, there is no remedy. It seemed like it. 6,000 demons but he met the unstoppable. What situation are you feeling like is out of your ability? It's beyond your ability to solve. Don't have the answer. I've tried a few things. It's not. What situation 
are you feeling is out of God doesn't care. God wouldn't move. Who, perhaps, have you given up on? This family member, too old. This family member, there's no way they're going to be saved. This family member walks away from God, doesn't want to have anything to do with God. Maybe it's a friend, a family. Don't believe in God anymore. I did, but I don't. I don't even think God's real. Where have you given up in your faith? What have you stopped praying for? Where have you settled? Maybe you just haven't invited Jesus to the party. Hell itself is no match for Jesus. Let's face it, perhaps 6,000 of the minions from, from hell are right there. Work. So then when we put it in that perspective, okay, my finances, not a problem for God. You know, never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Hey, I got a roof over my head. I'm eating better than bread and water. Your kids, how in the world can I help my kids through a, an educational system that perhaps is leading them in a wrong direction? Perhaps. How do I help my kids who are sh struggling with, or maybe neighbors' kids, they're struggling with questions that we never, it never crossed our minds. And you're like, how do I help lay a foundation? Do I want to have kids and bring them into that even? I'm sure, I know that crosses young people's minds. Do I want to bring kids into this? Your job, the grief that you might be facing. You know, a few weeks ago we talked about not something I was meditating on for a long time. His presence is the answer. Like whatever the problem, just get in his presence. And here, that's exactly what happened. Jesus showed up. Victory. Jesus transforms the chaos of our life. Not only does he, is he willing to speak it out, face it head on, and then defeat it, then he transforms that chaos. What a transformation. So Jesus casts out these demons. They go into the pigs. They run off the cliff. And it says, then all the people ran to the town and the countryside. So they're like scattering to go tell. You would, you would not believe what I just saw. You know Crazy Harry? He's different now. And so they run. And, then, and, and oh, by the way, also, and it was just a side note, by the way. What they were really were amazed up about was Crazy Harry. It, it says, oh, and also told them about the, the pig. That's the way it's listed there. And so how long did that take for them to run and tell and talk? I don't know. An hour? Two hours? I don't know. But they all came back, and they find crazy hair. They didn't go. They didn't really see that. He was running around like a crazy man. Oh, and he had clothes on. Amen. Amen. He had clothes on. And he was in his right mind. They didn't think he had a right mind, but he was in, he was sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. And it's either Matthew or, or Luke mentioned, he wasn't just sitting there. He was sitting at Jesus. What does that remind you of, sitting at Jesus' feet? Who does that remind you of? Mary? She chose the good choice. She was sitting at his feet. So the 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 picture is, he wasn't just sitting, but he was sitting there like this. And, and however long they were gone, an hour, I don't know, two hours, he was having a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. 
After the demons were out, now he could have this one-on-one -on -one conversation and learn. And, and he was just like, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind, oh, and excitedly sharing his testimony. That's how it, this man was led. But the, the people were amazed. Does your transformation still cause amazement? Do people look at your life? and Now, maybe they didn't know you years ago, but do they know you enough that you can share that and, and what God has done? And they see you're, so, you're different than what most in the world are. People should see something, and there should be an amazement of our lives. Not because... I guarantee you, far from perfect. I sin, as I will remind us. I sin, I make mistakes, I'm selfish, I'm on, uh, you know, I think about myself, I'm faithless at times, I'm lazy. I struggle with all those things. But people should see transformation. There's a difference. And when they saw this man, it was so astonishing they were afraid. Does your transformation still cause it? Interesting that there were three times in this situation that Jesus was begged. I don't get begged very often. First of all, the demons begged Jesus not to torture him. Then the townspeople, it's either Matthew or Luke uses this terminology, pleaded. They begged him to leave. And then the demoniac, the healed guy, he's like, he begged him, please let me go with you. Why all this pleading with Jesus? Because Jesus is Jesus. He is the Son of God. And so he has the authority. He can cast out 6,000 demons without thinking about it because he's Jesus. And so there's that, if you want something done, you go to Jesus. But the people were so afraid that amazingly, they asked Jesus something they could never ask. Please leave. Begged him. Please leave. What? Sometimes transformation is scary. When I see somebody's life, you're like, what if they had asked him? Huh. I wonder what. He would have stayed. Look at the Jews initially. What if you invite Jesus? What if you invite Jesus to get closer to your life? Instead of, this is enough. I've seen enough. I'm good here. But if you want me. This guy, the transformation of, of the chaos in, in his life, he basically... With Jesus and the disciples, right? It's 12 of them, plus Jesus. He's like, I want to be the 13th disciple. Let, let me go with you. I want to be a part of this. He's like, new purpose, new life. Man, I want to go with you. And Jesus says, no. Sometimes God's plan, how he wants to use you and I, is different even though we think it's a good plan. I thought, I got a different plan. Especially because Jesus couldn't stay there because they didn't want him there. So he's like, he's getting into the boat and the guy says, let me go with you. Jesus says, no, go. Tell everybody. I can't. I've got to go. But you're going to go. And interesting, so he went to where? The Decapolis. Obviously, we know that's 10 cities. There's probably 10 to 14 cities that this was about. And a square, you know, 240, 250 square mile area that it says, this man went and began to tell in the Decapolis. This is a one-man mission team. Sorry. <laughs> this is just one guy. Jesus and the disciples leave. Bye. And so he what's he do? Wait, where was his training? He had one thing. 
am. I am so not the same. Chaos. Jesus seeks it out. Whatever chaos, the feeling or the challenges doesn't destroy. He defeats it without fear. Satan and the demons surrender to Jesus. And then he transforms it to where this man went to, he covered a few hundred and some square miles in cities just for me. That's all he did. What has God done for you? And the mercy he showed you. God, I can prove that. That'll prove it. You've got your story. What God has done. I would remind us that Jesus seeks chaos, defeats it, transforms it, but we trust him to calm our own.